All right, good morning, church. All right, good to see you guys. Missed you all last week. Let's, uh, missed you. All right, let's stand to our feet and let's worship together.
the picture that you're going before us and behind us. You've got this. You're leading the way and you're taking care of the mistakes that we make along the way. God, I love that we can trust your character and who you are, that you're faithful, that you provide, that you're the healer, that you've got all the circumstances worked out, that we don't have to know. We don't have to know. We just have to trust. We have to let go. God, we just ask that you would truly shift our perspectives to a heavenly perspective. And that this morning, we would have ears and eyes and minds that are open to be transformed through the hearing of your word. Because that's how you're speaking to us. How sad to know that we have a way that you would speak to us and that we wouldn't listen. You want to talk with us and that we get to hear that through your word. We have access to that through your word. So thank you, Lord, that you've given us that. And would we be obedient to follow it? Would we listen today? Would we be changed today? In Jesus' name. to welcome you this morning to Vertical Church South Police. So glad to see all of you here this morning joined together, lifting high the name of Jesus alongside one another. If you're online, welcome. If it's your first time or if you've been here from the beginning, we are just so grateful to have you a part of our service this morning. So good morning and welcome to church today. All right, well, if it's your first time or if you've been here forever, we do something every Sunday morning and it's called the Sunday Morning Register. It's really easy. All you have to do is take out your smartphone, open up the camera app and point it in the direction of the seat back in front of you. And that first column, there is a QR code that says register. It'll open up a link for you. It's just a few simple questions letting us know that you joined us here today. So thank you so much for registering. And also, if you would like to do your giving, your tithe, or your offering, you can do that also at verticalgalpolice.org and find the giving tab. You can do it if you already have our app downloaded right there on the giving button, or you can do it in person today in the back of the sanctuary in the giving box. Those are the ways that you can give. And you know, we are able to use that money for a lot of things. I think of around the world, like Nepal and the missionaries that we support there. I think about right here in our community, whenever we're able to, like going back to school, our teachers, we've been able to support them in many ways as well with school supplies and uh, just really encouraging them as they face their school years. I think about what, right here in our own church and the ways that we're able to also support ministries that happen right here. So thank you all so much for giving. Well, we only have a few announcements, and one is that Transform Your Summer is back this Wednesday night right here in the sanctuary. It's been going on this summer. It's been a great time to be together. It's like a large gathering, then with a small gathering at the round table. So you get the best of both worlds. It's laid back, a really great time. Uh, you get to just talk and chat with people at your table, and um, I really want to encourage you to come. It's something you can jump into. You don't have to have been here from the start of these. You can just come in and out of them. So please, if you've thought about it or if you have time this Wednesday, we'd love for you to join us. And speaking of that, we're going to eat dinner together again. So 6 p.m. is when we'll start eating. Be looking for an email and a text that will have our sign-up list for some things that you can bring along to add to our dinner buffet line. So um, be looking for that. We'd love to have you guys with us. 6 p.m. dinner and 6.30 transform your summer this Wednesday night. We also have Kidsmen and Teens will be happening. So love to see you guys all there. And also want to go ahead and get this on your calendar. Save the date, August 13th, we're going to be doing a church-wide uh, cleanup. So we're going to be doing some things to tidy up our building and uh, make it all shiny and, and good and taken care of. The Lord loves when we are excellent caretakers of his house, right? And so we definitely want to spend some time loving on our building inside and outside. 
There's more details to come, so as far as time and if there's anything we need you to bring, but go ahead and just mark on your calendar, get it set in your mind. August 13th, we're gonna be doing a church-wide work day. Well, I hope that you have engaged with the Lord this morning, whether it's through worship or maybe it's through a, a God-honoring conversation that you had, maybe in the parking lot or when you dropped off your kids. Maybe it's just the warm smile and the greeting that you received at the coffee bar, or maybe it's just a moment that you had with the Lord sitting here in the service already. Um, either way, we just hope that you have engaged with the Lord today and that you all know that you are loved. simple question is a life-altering implication. You should read the Word of God. That's why Jesus also says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus knows that there is a spiritual hunger inside of every human heart that can only be satisfied by consuming the words of God. Christian, give yourself to the Word of God. The Word of God is a rock, strong and steady. It doesn't budge, break, or crumble under pressure. It's an anchor in the storm, keeping us calm when everything around us is chaotic. The Word of God is a mirror, showing us who we really are. You don't just read the Word of God, it reads you. It's a treasure beautiful in every dimension and worth every effort of discovery. It brings endless joy and eternal riches to all who find it. It's a fire spreading across the world to bring heat and life. It's a river bringing life and power to everything it touches. The Word of God is a seed planted deep inside of our hearts, producing the fruit of holiness and righteousness. The Word of God is a sword dividing true and false, right and wrong, good and evil. It's a hammer, crushing what needs to be crushed and breaking what needs to be broken. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to show us our path. So let the voice of God be the first, the last, and the loudest voice in your ear today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. Give yourself to the Word of God. Good morning, church. I, uh, you know, there's this ongoing joke at the house that every time Sarah, Sarah tries to print something, that just it just doesn't work for her, you know. And I, I, I love this joke because I just, you know, I make fun of her, and I'll say, you just you just hit the print button, you know, and it'll print, and, you know, and it doesn't happen for her, and I come along, and I hit the button, and it prints, and, you know, she's mad, but the one time that I really need it to print, it doesn't print for me last night, so I, I, I'm just, I'm not trying to be fancy with the laptop, or trying to be cool, or new age, <laughs> my printer just didn't work, and, um, you know, the funny thing is, it's not really funny, it's, I don't know, <laughs> this past week at camp, and I can go on and on about camp stories, but the preacher, he preached off his laptop, and I, I thought to myself, I thought, man, I, that's not a good idea, man, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't trust that, you know, and sure enough, like, he's up there one night, and his, his computer just dies or like just goes to sleep or something so he has to like stop the sermon and like log him back in and I'm thinking to my I honestly think to myself I almost text Dustin this I was like paper wouldn't do it to you man you know I said but here I am so if my computer if my computer dies and I can't get it back I'm going to nonchalantly just throw it off the table and just probably start randomly telling camp stories just go with it amen me on occasion and uh we'll get through but we're going to continue our series this morning on why we need the Word of God. 
I just say I appreciate the the men that's already preached in this series. Um, love those guys, uh, their effort in getting in the Word and digging deep. We're in Psalm 19, 7 through 11. I'll read our text, and then we'll hit the the verse that was given to me. Psalm 19, starting verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. This morning, we're going to look at verse 10. And uh, that's what we're going to focus on this morning. And we'll talk about the importance of not just reading, but digging deeper into the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, I'm just so very thankful for this opportunity to be used. Thankful for this church, these people, our pastor, Lord. And uh, I pray, God, that you uh, interject this morning, uh, I pray that we just get something from your word today, that you convict us with your word, that we leave some, leave here today, God, that something uh, will stick and that we can apply. And Lord, I pray these people forget my name and just remember your word. So uh, thank you again, Lord, for all that you do. I'm thankful for who you are to us and uh, your goodness, God. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 10 again. It says, More to be desired are they than gold, and much more than fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. So he's saying more to be desired. And let's back up. He says, what, what is more to be desired? We're talking about his law, his testimony, his precepts, his commandments, his rules. He says, more to be desired than gold. Even much fine gold. <clears throat> gold is the standard for wealth, right? It was true in David's time. It's true today. But he makes a point to say even fine gold. And when he says fine gold, he's saying 100% gold. You know, um, you know, you might have some gold on you today, your wedding band or whatever. Um, it's probably 14 karat. Uh, fun fact, your 14 karat gold ring is in fact only like 58% gold, okay? Um, it's not really feasible to use fine gold, 24 karat as jewelry, it's too soft. But he says even fine gold. So it's the highest standard of wealth, right? You ever heard the statement, the gold standard, right? That's why we use that statement, the gold standard, the highest standard of wealth. David's saying his word, which is eternal, should be more desired than gold. Even as our most precious commodity, gold, it's temporal and will fade away. It will fade away. And he goes on, he says, honey. He says, sweeter than honey. He also said that the word is sweeter than honey, just as gold is a standard for, for wealth. Um, honey is like the standard for, for sweetness, right? You know, I, uh, I keep bees. I'm not good at it. Well, I'm good at it. I'm just lazy. I just don't <laughs> mess with them much anymore. But on occasion, I go out there and I get some honey, right? And there's nothing better than sticking your finger down in the beehive and getting a taste of honey straight from the hive. It's just, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's sweet. It's pure. It's just natural. It's a beautiful thing. It's it's something that came just you think it came straight from the Lord, right? But yet David says God's word is sweeter. 
So if we start to value God's word as David describes, then we will want to not just read his word, but study it and learn it. I was uh, trying to think of this illustration. I never did find uh, the link to it or whatever, this illustration I, I heard some time ago, some sermon. And I thought that'd be cool, you know, to use that illustration or something like it. And I never found anything, but randomly surfing through online trying to find this illustration, I ran across this article. And it sounds real simplistic, you know, but I thought, you know, I thought it was kind of cool. And the article says, learn the difference between learn and study. It's funny because this uh, website, this guy's like teaching, he's like teaching English to Japanese people or something. I don't know. But he says, study is a process. When you study, you use tools such as books and computers in order to help you get information to your head. You study because you want to learn something. And he says, learning is what happens as a result of studying or experience. When you learn something, you have it in your head forever. You know, some things, you know, after we learn, we don't forget, right? We don't forget how to ride a bike. Uh, we don't forget how to read. Um, we don't forget, uh, you know, all these things. Um, you don't, for some reason, I, I still remember the, the code. Mike Tyson, anybody here? Mike Tyson punch out back in the day, Nintendo, you know, 07373 Guess crazy, Mike Tyson. Why do I remember that, you know? <laughs> Contra, up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, B, A, to get 30 lives. Um, a couple years ago, I was, this is really off. I'm getting off. Dustin, you got to stop me. Um, a couple years ago, I was playing Mario 2 for some reason. And, like, I was on some level. And I was like, I, I didn't know what was going on. But my fingers were just moving. And, like, I was living, I was, like, kept on living through this thing. I was like, what, you know, it's like this muscle memory. Some things you just don't forget, right? Um, and maybe I played too many video games when I was a kid. But... <laughs> But some things we don't forget because I, I learned those things. And that's why we say we study the Bible and we don't say we are learning the Bible. It's too, too broad of a spectrum for us to say we've learned it all. Now we, you know, as we talk today, you know, there's concepts that we can learn of the Bible. And uh, oftentimes that we're not going to know an exact reference or whatever, but, you know, you, you know not to lie, you know not to steal, you know, you know these simple things. Uh, you learn concepts. But studying or digging in the word is not a new concept to us at all. Our pastor, I you know, love him to death, I appreciate him for it. He's just always hounding us to get in God's word and dig in God's word. And honestly, the, every time you pick up your Bible, it's not going to probably be some deep study session, you know. Um, me reading in my quiet time or, you know, reading to prepare a sermon is two different things. But understanding that if, you, if we always take scripture for face value, we could be missing something deeper, some deeper meaning. As a quick refresher, let's, uh, you know, the studying or digging in, see what that looks like. I had something better planned here, but I'll just talk it out. Being like seashells, anybody like look, look for seashells at, at the beach? Um, you know, went to the beach this year, and you know, sometimes we go with Brandon Kelsey to the beach, and the adults they're always over there, like you know, being adults, and I'm look, looking around for seashells like a you know, eight year old boy, and um, but I love it, you know. Uh, I'm not. I'm not very good at it. Somehow, like, there's some old lady or something walking down the ocean, down the beach, and she's got this handful of, like these kind of cool shells. And I've, you know, found one thing for the week. You know, it's even worth keeping. But um, I like to look for seashells. You know. But if you notice, as you're walking just down the beach and just looking at the ground, you know, the the sand on top of the sand, about all you're going to find on top for the most part, is broken shells, right? 
when we take God's word just for face value, oftentimes we just get bits and pieces of the meaning. Like John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in, that in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, right? Um, which is, you know, a great verse. But, you know, and, and, and of course that's one of the verses, you know, the kids learn early, we all learn early. Um, but, if, you know, if we just take it for face value, we're, we're missing some, some deeper stuff there. In this past year, while we was at the beach, I forget who it was. We seen somebody, seen somebody, I don't know, some old man. He said, he said if you want some good shells, you got to dig in the sand. You got to dig deep. So, uh, you know, next day I'm out there with a plastic shovel, you know. <laughs> I, I didn't find anything. Anyway, it's, I probably should have skipped the illustration. But... <laughs> But if you dig in the sand a bit, you start finding some better shells, or in this case, some deeper meaning. So like if we, we took John 3, 16 for face value, which is good at face value, but then if we start digging in and start really analyzing it, you know, reading slow, you know, for God, you know, who's God? He's, he's our creator, our sustainer, uh, so loved. And that word so, it's, you know, it's intending to be so much. He loved us so much. He gave his only son, you know, loved the world. I mean, he loved the world and all that's in it, you know. Even while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? He loved the world. And when you start digging in, it means something deeper, right? But if you keep digging, you, sometimes you have an opportunity to find a real treasure. And you take that verse, and, and now you know what the verse means, and you, you broke down the verse, and then you start putting context with the chapter. You know, who is he talking to? Talking to this Nicodemus guy, you know, he's, he's this ruler of the Jews, this, this uh, you know, this, you know he, he knew the law, he's just... You know, this genius when it comes to the law, but yet he comes to Christ, you know, wanting to know about eternal life. You know, he's supposed to know it all, but yet, you know, he, he clearly doesn't because he doesn't have Christ, right? And later on, you know, we see verse 16 and verse 17. says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world's condemned already. You know, and you start painting a better picture of what 16 really means. You know, we're already condemned. And we so need Christ in our life. If we don't study, we, won't, we will not learn it. We can't apply it, and there'll be no bearing on your life. I... Oftentimes, uh, tell my small group, and I, it's, it, if I say something to my small group, it's, it's hit me first, or it's hit me all, you know, at the same time already. But if we're reading and not applying it, then it's, it's pointless, right? And I'll just be transparent. I mean, for a while after Sarah got off summer break, and for a while there, my, my quiet times it just threw off my schedule, her not getting up in the morning. And it's like my quiet times was legalistic, you know. I was just getting, I was reading the thing. I'd read for a while and I'd pray for a lot of said time. And if, if you're not getting to the point where you're excited about getting up and getting the word, then maybe you need to change things up a little bit, you know. But when we neglect God's word, we are rejecting the only truth we have available to us to use. God's word is the most important resource we have. John MacArthur said in his commentary on Psalm 19, the Holy Scripture is of much greater benefit to us than day or night, than the air we breathe or the light of the sun. Do we, do we feel that weight? 
do we do we feel the weight of this this book, this word, and how it can impact us? There's um came up three just benefits of what we get out of God's word when we study it and learn it. And number one is God's word gives us direction. Isn't uh, GPS amazing? Anybody remember MapQuest? Anybody, did anybody use MapQuest back in the day? Printing the, the you know, directions. You know, you get online and you have to, you know, and you print them out and hopefully the printer works. And I think, I think once the first time we went to the beach, didn't we use MapQuest? First time we've been to the beach, yeah. I mean, you know, I, my phone at that point didn't have, it was like a flip phone, didn't have GPS. But it's amazing, right? I mean, I can, you know, but it spoiled me. I don't, I don't know how to get anywhere. You know, Sarah and I will go to Columbus, and she's all about, like, trying to learn and learn and remember how to get places. And not me, I'm, like, just typing it in, you know. You know, I'll go to Rainbows. I won't put it in. But... <laughs> So she's yelling at me. She's like, just put that thing down. Well, you know, we can figure it out. I'm like, nah, you know, we got to, you know, get there efficiently. I like to be efficient. But just as we use the GPS to give us direction, we should use the Bible to direct our lives. Our life is a path. Every decision that we make has a potential to change our path, right? Decisions made by our own wisdom or worldly wisdom will lead us to destruction every time. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. You know, when we deviate from God's word or, or God's wisdom, you know, I don't think we're we're not sitting around thinking to ourselves, you know, ha ha, you know, kind of laughing in the face of God, I got this. You know, we legitimately think we know the right way. It seems right to us. My own wisdom seems right. Um, you know, not, not praying about things, you know, seems right. And not using godly wisdom seems right. But it's, it's end is is death. The way is death. God's word gives us direction. But if I can't read a map, you know, if I don't know, if I, if I open a map, if I can't read it, I'm lost. You know, if I don't apply it or don't follow it. If I look at a recipe to bake a cake, if I don't know how to read it and I don't follow the instructions for the recipe, the cake is probably going to be nasty, right? If I don't understand his word and don't apply it in my life, our life will be in shambles. Proverbs 20 and 24 says, A person's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand their own way? A person's steps are directed by the Lord, how can we understand our own way? And we cannot. And Jeremiah ten twenty three says, Lord, I know the people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. And more often than not, we, we want to direct our own steps. We want to make our own way. We don't want to we don't want to pray about the little things. We don't want to seek God's wisdom about the things in life that, you know, we feel like we have this. We got this. We know better. You know, I was talking about, Brooke was talking about humility earlier. And, uh, and it's what boils down to is being proud. We'll talk about more about that later. The God word, <clears throat> number two, God's word equips us to help others. At work, uh, we, we have these things, these job safety assessments. And one thing that we, we check the box for, you know, we say that we're going to use the proper tools for the job. A while back, I had some issues with my lawnmower. 
and it was like something wrong with the charging system. It wasn't charging the battery, and this fuse kept on blowing and melting and all this. And I just kept on fixing this and that. I'm not, I don't consider myself a mechanic, but I kept on doing th these little things. And I was watching some YouTube videos, and I decided I was going to change the, the charging coil, you know, the, the stator under the flywheel. I, I thought, I can do this. And uh, I talked to my, you know, you know, Brandon over here. I was talking to him about it. And Sean Northup, they don't even really know each other. But two separate occasions, I was telling them, I said, I think I'm going to change this thing out. You know, I'm going to buy this part and change this thing out. And they're both like, you better take out the bridge for it, you know. And I was like, no, you know, pride kind of hit me a little bit. I thought, no, I'm going to fix this. I don't care. <laughs> I don't, I'll, if I don't fix it, I'll run it in the pond and buy a new one and say I fixed it, you know. <laughs> but uh, I fixed it. But during this process, you know, I mean, it's kind of an extensive job, you know. Uh, I was trying to be well organized with my tools, you know, having the proper tool for the job. And a couple occasions, like, uh, you know, for – you know, people kind of, you know, jab at me, some friends, you know, jab at me because I have all these tools and I don't know how to use them, whatever. But I'm learning, right? But, you know, like like these uh, felt head sockets, you know, I was like, I, I never really understood the, the purpose of that. It's like, I'll just get a screwdriver. But sure enough, there's like these these bolts and it had a Phillips head on it in, this, in the lawnmower and I had to get these sockets out and I use them. I was feeling proud of myself. I was like, you know. And... I had the proper tools for the job, right? When you, when we have the Bible in our hearts, it, it's like having the right tool for the job. You know, as opposed to saying, you know, questioning what size wrench I need, we can say, um, you know, what does the Bible say about that? We need to be careful not to lean on our own wisdom, intelligence, personalities, our own truth when we're trying to help others or, you know, encourage others. They, um, you know, one thing, I, I, there's some Christian cliches, and I try not to fall into them. You know, one thing that I can't stand is people, you know, as, as words of comfort, people want to say everything happens for a reason. That's the best you got. Just don't use it, you know. Um, but don't rely on your own wisdom and your own truth when people really need the word of God. But a little crowd participation. Um, are we prepared to answer any questions or, or console any situation during a trial with the word? Do, does everyone have the Bible memorized so much that they can... They can jump in there with the with the word of God for any situation. Anybody, anybody, anybody that good? I'm not either. Um, but the more we read, the more we study, the more we learn, the better prepared we'll be. And it's okay to say I don't know, you know. And you know when when you're trying to encourage someone or help someone that's in need or witness to someone. You know, there's a good chance you're not going to run across some deep theological question. But if you do, just say, I don't know, right? Say, I don't know. Yeah, let me talk to my small group leader, my pastor, and I'll get back with you. Or just Google it, right? I don't know. <laughs> the pastor says it all the time. Sarah's laughing at me, <laughs> which I, you know, I appreciate. Google's a tool. Use it, right? But I would say the biggest reason that we don't witness or encourage more is because we're afraid that we're going to be asked a question that we don't know the answer to. Guys, that, that's, that's some, just being transparent again, that's some deep fear I have. That somebody asking me a question I don't, I don't know the answer to, whether it be a spiritual situation or at work, you know. And what is that, guys? Just pride, right? Just pride. So don't don't not intervene in someone's life uh, because we're proud and we're afraid that we're not going to know the right thing to say or whatever. Uh, again, more often than not, it's it's not going to take some deep theological answer 
it's going to take you loving them and encouraging them. And if you don't know, if you don't know exactly what they want to know or need to know, you do know something. And if you just came to the Lord this morning, you know that much. You know, say, you know what, well, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. All I know is, is Christ saved me. He loves me. We'll go from there. and We'll figure out the rest later. We'll figure out together. But the third thing we find in God's word is it reveals who he is and his will. Francis Chan, I heard him say a while back, he said, he was talking about his in one of the, Paul's letters, he made the comment that he knows, he knows the Apostle Paul. Like he's like, I know him, you know. I thought, man, that's cool. There's some truth there, you know. When you read his letters over and over, you start to paint a picture of who he is, his personality, his demeanor, right, and all these things, his likes, his dislikes. And if that's true of Paul, you know, if we can read through Paul's letters and get to know him, then it's also true of God and the totality of his word. From in the beginning to the, to, you know, from in the beginning in Genesis to uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with all, amen, in Revelation, the Bible's full of, of every verse just describes God somehow. And a while back was talking to our teens and was talking about different things that we can do while we study. That's something I didn't do more myself also. But when we read, you know, it's a cool thing to, whatever you read, think to yourself, what character, ter- characteristic of God is shown here, right? In every text, every story, the Bible reveals who God is. I've, I've heard a few different preachers use the term, you know, having their Isaiah 6 moment or experience. I was, um, I was, I was far too old to have my, my moment to start to grasp the character of God. And when all of a sudden the truth of Isaiah 6 or a similar passage consumes us, maybe for the first time we start to understand who we serve. And, you know, Isaiah 6, of course, when, when Isaiah seen the vision of the throne room, you know, I love it. I, it was one of my memory verses, you know, the first four, five, six verses, whatever, six. I, I'd go walk around the house quoting it so much. Sarah, the first few days, Sarah was like, yeah, that's cool, you know, woo. and after about a week, she's like really trying not to like, you know, dog it because I'm not quoting scripture, but she's like, okay, we we get it, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, and the year King Uzziah, uh, we get it, you know, but whether it be Isaiah 6, uh, Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, 57, 15, or Exodus 15, 11, there should be some passage that moves us, sends chills up our spine and sometimes break us down tears when we see who God is to us. Stephen Lawson said, who you believe God to be, what he is like, is the single most important factor in your life. And friends, only when you start to grasp who we are serving will we start caring about his will, right? Right? The Bible is full of examples how we should live, what we should do, what's pleasing to God. But, uh, you know, talking about God's will, I mean, that's deep, right? But Romans 12. I just want to talk about Romans 12. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to bring Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, 
what is good and acceptable and perfect. He says a living sacrifice. Because of Christ, you know, we don't need to slay goats and cows and, and, and burn carcasses and whatever. We don't need that anymore. Christ was our sacrifice. But now we are to give ourselves as a living sacrifice. And this sounds really morbid. I was thinking, but man, that's, that's kind of harder, right? I mean, it'd be easier just to, you know, give ourselves up as a dead sacrifice. But now we got, we got to live us out. You know, we got expectations and we got, uh, we got to deal with this world, right? But he says, holy and acceptable. There's expectations to be set apart. Being holy, set yourself apart from the world. He says, your spiritual worship. The King James Version uh, actually says, um, your reasonable service. And uh, the first time I've seen this spiritual worship thing in the ESV, I was at Chester Baptist Church, and Larry Haley, anybody know Larry? Remember Larry? Larry Haley was uh, our intern pastor, and if you knew Larry, he had this infectious smile. And, but one day, I forget what we was talking about, but I said something about Romans 12, 1 and 2. I think I, I quoted for some reason while we was talking. He said, he said, look at this. And he, I don't know if he had an ESV or whatever, he broke it open. He said, ESV says spiritual worship as opposed to reasonable service. Spiritual worship. And then he's just cheesing, you know, because it's in, like it's just one of those eye-opening things, you know. And that's that's one of the reasons that we need to not just read but study and learn and dig deep, right? Reasonable service. I always thought that was cool. I thought, man, that's 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 our reasonable service to God, you know, present ourselves. And then Larry's like, nah. Oh, it's your spiritual worship, right? John Piper says, worship means using your minds, hearts, and bodies to express the worth of God and all he is for us in Jesus. There's a way to live, a way to love that does that. Fun fact, you know, the first time the Bible mentions worship is uh, in Genesis. Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac. And they got to the point that they could see from a distance. And Abraham says, Told his servants, you, you stay here. And me and the boy, we're going to worship. And we'll come back. Uh, Brooke was talking about worship this morning being a form of, you know, dependence. You know, and we see here. I mean, do you, do you think how dependent on God do you think Abraham was at that point? He's about to run a knife through his son, right? That was worship. Worship, this isn't just us here Sunday mornings, you know, while they sing. Worship is every day in our life. It's obedience. It's dependence. It's how we live. It's how we work. It's, it's our jobs. It's, it's how we show Christ in our everyday life. He says, do not be conformed to this world. He says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that kind of transformation can only can occur only as the Holy Spirit changes our thinking through consistent study and meditation of the scriptures. The renewed mind is one saturated and controlled by the word of God. The renewed mind is one saturated and controlled by the word of God. If we don't read, study, and learn, we'll never have direction in our life. We'll never be equipped to help our brothers and sisters in need. We'll never understand who God is to us. We'll never understand his will, right? This, this book this is the only thing we have. It's the only truth we have. I just want to encourage you to lean into it today. 
know, this series, Life in the Word, it's, it's deep. We could, we could just do this. We could repeat this thing over and over and over, and we just get something from it every time. But let's not n- neglect the one consistent thing we have in this life, this Word of God. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're so thankful for your word that you give us, Lord, this truth that only you can provide. And I pray, Lord, that we are convicted to dig deep. Lord, that we, we are encouraged to be in your word daily and seek this direction and seek these tools that we need to live this life that be pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that your word will reveal who you are to us and what you have us to do in this life. God, just uh, just be with us. I pray these words just jump, jump off the page to us every time we open it. Again, thank, thankful for this opportunity, Lord. I'm, I'm thankful for your word, your spirit, your grace and mercy. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How good is he? We don't have to be, you know, in the Hebrew and Greek, you know, like Pastor John. But guys, we can, we can know a lot more than we do. Right? But, uh, thankful for everyone's here. Uh, camp was awesome. 